Good morning, everyone. We are going to begin the broadcast in just a few moments, but we are going to allow folks a, just a small amount of leeway to join us this morning. So we will be back shortly. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest in the Lighting Design Lab educational webinar series. My name is Sean Dara. I am Senior Lighting Specialist at the Lighting Design Lab. On behalf of the Lighting Design Lab and Seattle City Light, I'd like to welcome you to Commercial Heat Pump Water Heating. Design, Operations, and Maintenance Deep Dive. This is the fourth part of the series. And we will have presenting for us today, Evan Green, with assistance from Sarah Pastor and Sean Hoffman in the moderation capacity. So a couple of uh, housekeeping things, uh, just a, a quick uh, note, Lighting Design Lab is in fact part of Seattle City Light. So thank you to City Light for uh, helping to bring you these great uh, uh, webinars. And you are going to be muted throughout the talk today. If you have questions, and we strongly encourage questions, please go ahead and use the questions and chat feature that you'll see in the uh, tab for the webinar series. You'll be able to go ahead and open that up and answer your uh, ask your questions through that. And uh, I suspect that uh, either questions will be held until uh, the end, or if there are significant uh, questions that really should be addressed at the time, they may be addressed as well. But uh, we will go ahead and address all questions uh, in the meantime. If you have any questions about the Lighting Design Lab, please go ahead and go to lightingdesignlab.com, or you can email me, Sean, S-H-A-U-N dot Dara, D-A-R-R-E-G-H, at seattle.gov. And with that, I will say, Evan, please take it away. Hey, thanks, Sean, and thanks for having me on here at the Lighting Design Lab. Uh, I'll introduce myself, and I'll also give the other Sean on the call a chance to introduce himself from DNR. Uh, my name's Evan Green. I'm a research engineer at Ecotope, and we're a design firm in Seattle that is focused on designing really energy-efficient plumbing and mechanical systems in our buildings. So I'm my job is to both interface with manufacturers to try and get the right documentation out there, as well as interface with installers and any contractors that are dealing with these systems to try and make the, the installation process as smoothly as possible. And where I came from, before I came to Ecotope, um, was really a great training ground for all of this work. And that was as an applications engineer at Colmac Water Heat. So that's in the that's a heat pump manufacturer you might be aware of in the northeast corner of Washington State, which is where I'm located currently uh, working remotely for Ecotope. So with that, I'll give Sean, if you're online here, I'll give you a quick chance to introduce yourself as part of the DNR Learn team. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Evan. Um, so my name is Sean Hoffman, and I'm with DNR, and I'll be leading moderation alongside Sarah Pastor. Uh, today's training's two hours with a small break about halfway between. Um, throughout the presentation, we'll be using Slido for participation and for questions. Uh, and then also feel free to ask questions um, inside the questions tab, and we'll get to them during breaks or during um, you know, parts of the presentation where it seems pertinent to get those questions in. Um, also, keep an eye out for links and surveys in the chat box. And with that, I'll hand it back off to you, Evan. Yeah, thanks, Sean. And so to start off here, we're going to we're going to introduce Slido. If you haven't if you haven't done Slido before in the previous three section, sessions, I'll explain to you that it's a it's a really good way to get your feedback directly through our check-ins throughout this this learning session. So how Slido is going to work today is you you can go ahead and take your smartphone and you can aim the camera at this QR code in the top left here. Um, some people have had luck with this entering this design for code on Slido.com either on your smartphone or your computer, but lately we've it's been a little hit and miss. But I've seen 100% of the time this QR code scanning with your cell phone camera will work to get you into the surveys. So go ahead and get your phone out and uh, log into Slido here. And the first question I want to ask you in our check-in today is, where are you joining us from? I mentioned I'm in the, the northeast corner of Washington State, and we've, we've seen heat pumps work really well here, as well as all throughout Seattle. And all up and down the West Coast, I've I've overseen installations and equipment startups. So it's it's good to hear where you're coming from, to see to see what kind of demographic here and where we can talk about installing these these units. Great. So someone from Portland and Washington, D.C. So we're we're stretching out with um, who we're reaching with this Lying Design Lab. That's really great. And then someone calling from Seattle as well. I suspect there's a few of those, uh, which is fantastic. This applies to this. This content today definitely applies to all of these areas. As I was talking about before, heat pumps can have a a, a wide array of application locations that work really efficiently. And 100% of the people in this survey attended the first three sessions. But great, this will, this will be a great way to round out all that content and we'll also go over a review of the first three sessions as well to really cement all that, all that learning in because we've gone over a lot in the last, in this, this eight hour series. So one of the questions that someone brought with them to the session today is if we don't have heat pump water heater for research and have a 30 kilowatt tank, do we pipe primary system to inlet or outlet of the tank? And that's a great question. And it does depend on the configuration that you're using and their, their advantages and disadvantages to each configuration. And that is something that I will try to address as we review those different configurations for temperature maintenance later in the in the review part of this session today. So first, before we dive into session four, I will talk a little bit about what we covered in session three, and that was primarily um, taking the design drawings from an engineer as an installer or a plumbing contractor and then um, incorporating the proper details for the equipment to have a fully operational system. So that starts with finding contractors or subcontractors that uh, have the proper attributes to tackle a, a new system installation like this, as well as inputting some really fine details for your equipment specs and making sure that the, the schedule and the engineer's drawing lines up with with the with the options that the heat pump um, is needed to fulfill the design intent for that engineer's design. 
We also talked about the verification and the purchasing of the equipment and working how it's really important to work closely with your manufacturer and their rep as you as you go through the purchasing and the the PO process and the even the quoting process and make sure you have all the submittals properly laid out and all the information that the manufacturer's rep needs to make sure that there's if there's any additional packages or additional options that need to be selected to make this heat pump fit within the design and its intent, then those are really well covered in the in the final purchasing process. And then finally, we talked a little bit about, about installation and startup, and that's where we'll have a little bit of overlap today. We talked about some really high level portions of installation and startup, and today we'll dive a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of what you need to think about when you get the physical equipment into on site. So I want to check in with everyone and see how confident you feel about this, this detailing and installation process in terms of getting these designs from the engineering design to the operation of the heat pump water heater and all the detailing and purchasing uh, included in there. Good, we have, we have some confidence in the audience today, which is great. Uh, we went over a lot of high level things to think about in the last session, and then we will, we'll kind of cement that in leading into this session before we go into the, the finer details. So the key questions, the key question we're gonna try to answer today is how do I successfully start a commercial heat pump water heating system? and how do I maintain it? So then we can rely on that continuously consistent and reliable operation. Because these heat pump water heaters have the potential to have a really long life, and that's what we're aiming as an installer and a designer, and we wanna minimize the amount of cold water calls and warranty situations that we get into. And the way to do that is going to be to make sure that you follow all the details throughout the startup process and, and maintain proper coordination and cooperation with everyone else you're working with, as well as follow up with proper maintenance in it with these heat pump water heating systems. And that's really key because they're, they're not expensive to maintain, but it is crucial that you keep up with those maintenance cycles so you don't see degraded, degraded performance or reliability throughout their life. So to warm up here, we're going to talk about a case study in Seattle, Washington called Elizabeth James. And Elizabeth James is a cool project because it was it was an existing building that we retrofitted to make much more energy efficient. And this is a it's a senior housing for low income seniors. So it's really important that they get consistently hot water, but also that they that they don't have issues like overheating the water or providing any sort of conditions that might be able to scald the occupant. So we need to provide really consistent hot water as reliable as any other water heating system would be. So here's the piping configuration in Elizabeth James. And there was a question about if we have electric resistance in the temperature maintenance loop. Uh, how would we plumb that? So this is a good example of one way you could plumb it. And the way they did it at Elizabeth James was they actually, um, they have, they left the temperature, sorry, they left the, they left the heating tanks and the electric boilers that already existed in the building. They left those there and used those as the temperature maintenance system. And to zoom out just a little bit, the, the domestic hot water heating system serves two really important jobs and the first is going to be of course to provide hot water to the occupants whenever they turn on the tap right that's what you think of primarily when you think of these water heating systems but the second job it's doing that is served separately in a lot of these heat pump systems 
is they're actually maintaining the flow of hot water throughout the pipes throughout the day. Because if there's not a lot of usage in this building and the water's just sitting there in the pipes, it'll get really cold in the pipes. And then the next time someone turns a faucet on, it will just run cold water until those pipes are completely flushed of all that cold water, which could be tens or hundreds of gallons in certain buildings. So what we do to avoid that is we'll consistently provide fresh hot water to those hot water distribution pipes and then circulate that water. And so then it will slightly cool throughout that circulation process and it'll return back to the system warm but not hot and warm but not cold. And the reason we need to handle that separately in a lot of these heat pump systems is because heat pump water heaters like really cold water to bring in and heat it to a really high temperature in a single pass. So you'll see here that the cold water supply coming into the building is going to the bottom of this primary storage tank and also um, that really cold water is being pulled into these heat pumps to be heated to a high temperature in this in-series primary storage tank configuration. So these heat pumps run really efficiently because they can heat cold water up to a high temperature and then this separate load of the temperature maintenance system is being handled by the electric boilers at that were originally used to heat the entire water heating system at Elizabeth James. So if we take the cartoon filter off these schematics a little bit, we can see that we have all of the system components I talked about in the in the last slide. We have the the sand and heat pumps. We have four of them sitting outside. And these are CO2 heat pumps, so they handle the coldest temperatures in Seattle really well and maintain really high efficiency throughout. And you can see we have these insulated pipe hangers uh, hanging this copper piping on this unistrut here. And that is so we don't have any thermal heat transfer uh, through those mounts into a wall or into whatever it's mounting to. So that's really important. And this picture is before the pipes were insulated. So this will be one continuous line of insulation um, once this project's complete. And it is complete, but in terms of this picture, it wasn't quite complete yet. And then if you look at the next picture, we have these three primary storage tanks. These are plumbed in series, and these are paired with these four heat pump water heaters. So the cold water comes into the left side of the system, and then that water is pulled out of the bottom of this tank, goes through the heat pumps outside, and then they come back and charge the top of this tank with hot water. So then it backfill, backfills these three tanks in series and charges this entire storage configuration up to about 150 degrees. And then this last tank here is part of the temperature maintenance system. So it's sending hot water out to the building, which then circulates through the piping and comes back through this pipe here to the bottom of the temperature maintenance tank at, at probably 110 degrees on average. And then this picture on the top right you can see is an electric boiler, so an electric instantaneous water heater that they have mounted on the wall to maintain this temperature maintenance tank temperature. And what's really cool about this system and the way they plumbed it is we have the 150 degree water coming out of this primary storage, but instead of going to the mixing valve, it's going to the bottom of this temperature maintenance tank. So that's the in series or swing tank configuration um, that, that was asked about earlier. And so as soon as there's water drawn out to the building, this 150 degree water is drawn from this tank and then it works its way through this temperature maintenance tank. So it actually warms this tank up. So whenever there's hot water usage, that water is flowing through this tank at 150 degrees, mixes in with the water in this tank, and then you don't actually need to use this electric water heater to heat this temperature maintenance because it's absorbing that heat from the overheated water that's passing through it whenever water is used from the building. So really the only, the only time these auxiliary electric water heaters are used is when there's almost no usage from the building so there's no none of this hot domestic hot water that needs to be served out to the system and heat this tank. 
So if this water is sitting there waiting to be used and that, that temperature maintenance line is continuously circulating and cooling this tank down, that's when this electric water heater will kick on in the background. So that's how we maintain really efficient operation with these CO2 heat pumps that like really cold water um, while still not using too much electric heat. And the, the result of this retrofit system is they saved about 70% on their domestic hot water heating energy usage. So, so that's a huge savings that really pays off with these heat pump water heaters. So the key takeaway from this system is don't abandon existing equipment in retrofits because it can be recycled into the new installation. The, the temperature maintenance tank as well as that electric resistance uh, water heater were both salvaged from the previous installation to make a really efficient system. So now we're going to transition into the installation portion today and I'm going to cover some some high level factors of installation and some of the things you need to think about and I can't go through all of the installation parameters step by step one because we we only have two hours today and it's a it's a little bit different depending on the heat pump water heater you use so there's some common themes between all the different technologies that we're going to need to think about today um, but you need to make sure that you're communicating to make sure you're you're satisfying the specific equipment's needs that you're installing. So the three main points I want to get across today that are really reiterating a lot of what I was talking about last week in session three is you'll need to understand the design that you're working with. You'll need to coordinate with all of the other trades as well as the members on your team and then there are some physical installation considerations that you'll need to take into account as well. So first of all, we need to understand the design before we start any installation practices. And this does take extra time for an installer to fully understand the design before starting. And a lot of times that means in their, in their minds is a lot of money up front to to go through the work of understanding this design. But in the long run, it will definitely both save you time and money if you fully understand this before you install it, because there's gonna be a lot less physical rework once the system commissioning begins and there's functional startup from the, from the manufacturers. And there will also be a lot less time spent on coordination to fix problems that could have been addressed much more easily before installation started. So those are, there's definitely um, definitely negative impacts of not fully understanding the design ahead of time. And it might sound kind of scary, but I, I want to assure you there is, there are the proper resources out there through manufacturers, reps, and different engineering techniques to, to get these systems right the first time. So even though you can't go into it blindly, it's also uh, not a, super crazy system if you have the right communication lines in place. So the uh, second part of understanding this design is considering the best practices you're using as an installer. Uh, over decades of installing gas water heaters, installers have come up with some really great best practices that aren't always shown on the drawings. So um, the, the installer themselves may go above and beyond what the engineer has recommended through their design, but you, you don't want to abandon these best practices, but you want to consider them carefully and check in with the designer to make sure that they still apply to heat pumps as they would gas water heaters. So the, uh, a couple of common things I've seen are the connection locations are a lot different on gas water heaters versus heat pump water heaters. So if you if they look really strange in the drawings, there's usually a good reason that they look that strange way. So you'll want to check in with the engineer as well as possibly the, the manufacturer's rep or the manufacturing applications engineer. Because a lot of times these uh, 
just as installers are new to these heat pump designs, engineers are new to these designs as well. So if they can't, if the engineer can't walk you through what's happening in this design really closely, it'd be a really good idea to recommend that you get on a, a conference call or something like that, or some sort of coordination with the applications engineer that supplied them the, the design information that they need to make this heat pump water heater work correctly. So I might be a little surprised by now if you haven't gotten this, this next point I'm about to make throughout the last two sessions, and that is that coordination is key to a successful heat pump water heater installation. So that means um, working as a full team between all the different trades, that's, that's plumbing, that's mechanical, electrical, um, low voltage. These are all, it's important that everyone is totally on the same page about what's going on. Because if there's one person that knows everything about the system, but that that's not communicated to the rest of the team, then it's it's no better than if if nobody in the entire group knew about the system. So in doing this coordination, you want to remember to be proactive and not reactive. So that means uh, walk through the process as a team before you start the install. And you need to understand who's going to, who has the scope for different tasks. Um, there's always, there's a lot of overlap sometimes between low voltage control and electrical, and sometimes even plumbing. So it's really good to make sure that everyone's on the same page and you know where those, you kind of know where those lines in the sand are drawn on who does what in the system. So here we're, we're looking at the Ecotopes commissioning process and the, the four points or the four times throughout the installation that we kind of touch base with the contractors throughout. And the first is going to be a site meeting. So that's that uh, proactive coordination that I was talking about where all the different um, contractors are going to be in the same room with the engineer or in modern times, maybe on the same video call. And then you're going to walk through the design and through the installation and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. And if there's any big questions that the design doesn't lay out properly, then this is a great time to ask those before anything's actually um, been on site and being installed yet. Then the second touch base that Ecotope has in this commissioning process is during the rough-in where we have most of the equipment's actually bolted down but probably not plumbed up yet, probably not attached to, to electrical, but this gives a good sense of understanding of how everything's going to fit into the room and it also kind of brings forward any potential issues that you might have with clearance that weren't totally clear on the, on the plans. Then the third place we'll touch base is during the startup and functional testing of the equipment. So at this point, all the equipment's in and it's plumbed and there's controls wires, um, there's controls installed and the system is ready to be started up. So oftentimes there's a, there's a manufacturer's technician starting up the heat pump itself. A lot of times the, the plumber will set the set points on the, on the water heater and then once all of the once all of the equipment started up by those technicians, then Ecotope will go in and perform functional testing to make sure the system reacts as we expected it to uh, in the plan sets. And then oftentimes, and well, sometimes there's going to be little changes and little tweaks that need to be made to make that system um, align with the design. So there's often little recommendations to be made as well as a follow-up site visit to make sure that that system's operating as well as we intended it to after those little changes are made. So this process between three and four may be slightly iterative. If the, say if the system is uh, way off base and there wasn't really great communication leading up to the startup and functional testing, there might be a few sets of tweaks that need to be made to get the system up and running as expected.
So now we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts during the installation process and some of the physical considerations you'll need to think about when installing these heat pump water heaters. So the, the first thing we need to think about is do we have access to the actual mechanical room or the rooftop or wherever this heat pump and these tanks are going to be delivered? Uh, because a lot of times they're they're kind of big and awkward. So we need to think about um, where in the build process in the building sometimes does it make sense to get this heat pump in there. Uh, sometimes that's before you actually put the doors in in the mechanical room or if there's any exterior facades on the roof, you'll want to think about that scheduling and try to get the heat pump in there on the housekeeping pad before some of this stuff that would really get in your way is fully installed. And a lot of times that might include uh, incorporating a crane into the installation. So that's a, a big mobilization coordination that you need to think about. And that that's also a good point to make with your manufacturer's rep about crane scheduling and make sure that the lead times that you initially received for your equipment are still set in stone and still on track, especially with the with the delivery and supply chain issues that we've seen lately, it'd be great to really keep the manufacturer's rep in the loop as you do the scheduling. Because if the if the heat pump uh, order is pushed out four weeks and your crane was only going to be there for three weeks, then that's a lot of extra money you're going to have to put into that install to either keep that crate on site or remobilize once your heat pump gets there. And you also want to get the proper documentation from the manufacturer or their rep on how to mount this thing to the ground. Often there's seismic or vibration isolation that are offered by the manufacturer to make sure these heat pumps con consistently vibrating don't affect any occupant spaces or any um, tangential equipment as well as the seismic restraints that are required. Sometimes they're, they're often not required on the, the water heaters themselves, but usually they are required on the tanks. So you'll have to work with a structural engineer to make sure the seismic requirements are, are laid out properly and properly satisfied during your installation. And the last thing we need to think about is the actual maintenance and electrical clearance around these units. You need to think about when someone comes in here to maintain and change certain components that are wear components on this heat pump, will they actually be able to fit? And we've run into some electrical clearance issues in the past as well, where the full 36 inches in front of the electrical panel here isn't totally clear. So that means uh, totally changing the orientation of the heat pump, uh, which could be a, a pretty hefty cost if you're if you've already plumbed it up or something like that. So I want to I want to check in here and see what your key takeaway is from the from the installation light portion of this session. And you can you can drop any additional considerations in here that you found as an installer or a designer or even even installing systems at home. This is still really applicable. And with that, Sean, are there any questions in the chat by chance that we might be able to address while we wait for people to chime in? Yeah, so we had one question from John. Um, on the diagram of the Elizabeth James system, is there a significant difference between connecting the heat pump water heater outlet to the final stage tank as shown in the image versus connecting to the connecting into the pipe between the final stage tank and swing tank? Um, there is not. So let's see. Let me think about it for just a second. So you're talking about the final stage tank being the hottest tank in the primary storage. If the heat pump is dumping water directly into that tank versus dumping water into the line that exits that tank, you should you should get the same effect as long as you're talking about dumping it into the top of that final tank. Right, so oftentimes there's not an actual connection there, so people will 
um, plumb it directly into that final tank outlet between the primary heating, primary storage and the swing tank, which is totally fine. You just need to make sure as you just need to make sure that the installer doesn't have a check valve there, for example, that doesn't allow that water to flow backwards into that primary storage. Yeah, great question. I've seen it. I've probably more so seen it, seen it plumbed into that outlet pipe just because there's not typically an inlet on a standard tank up at the top there. Thank you for the question, John. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so a, a really great key takeaway regarding this is make sure you understand the system before you start the installation. And they talked about a university where they taught them to read all the questions before starting the exam. Yeah, that's that that is super applicable here and a, a great lesson for anyone. Really anything you're working on, see see what you're tackling and how you might be able to tackle it best how how you might be able to best tackle it before diving in. And lots of communication and coordination is a key takeaway. And I'm I'm glad that that shown through. So now that we we have our system properly installed, and in, at least uh, as our session pertains to it, then we can think about the maintenance that is required to keep this system operating um, functionally in the long term. And so this can, this maintenance portion should really be considered in all steps of the the heat pump design and installation owners need to think about what the overall maintenance cost will be when they're when they're considering buying a heat pump water heating system and designers should think about things like clearances and maintenance requirements in the long term as well as installers that are going to be um, pretty much passing the torch to the building manager in a lot of cases, they need to make it known to that building manager that the maintenance portion is really, really important. And so a uh, usually a service contract should be set up or the maintenance team for the building should be really well tuned into how to keep this system properly maintained. So as I mentioned earlier, the needs for different pieces of equipment will vary based on the manufacturer. So it's really important to refer to the equipment manuals and any documentation provided for that equipment, as well as you can check in with the reps or the manufacturers to make sure you're checking all the boxes if you're setting up a service schedule for these things. And a lot of times too, the warranty requirements will be based off um, regular maintenance. So you need to make sure any maintenance schedules or anything in the in the manufacturer's documentation are pasted in that mechanical room with the equipment. So then if any manufacturer's defects do arise, then you have you have the proof that you've been maintaining this equipment properly despite it being defective. It's really important to think about maintenance intervals as well and how those may actually vary based off your environment. So Make a note of the location that you're installing these into and your maintenance interval should start out pretty conservatively. So um, these different things that you'll need to do to service these heat pumps, do them a little more frequently um, up front, and then gauge how the components are wearing or how they're getting, uh, for example, how a filter is getting dirty or a heat exchanger is getting scaled up. And then you can adjust those timelines a little bit based off what your local environment is doing to the equipment itself. So a couple examples here are you might you might install a heat pump in the fall and it can go through winter and maybe the maybe the air filter is pretty clean throughout all of winter. But as soon as spring hits, maybe you're in an agricultural area and now all the plowing around this heat pump is just filling the filter with dust. So that's an example of where you'll need to adjust your maintenance interval because that agricultural work is really impacting uh, the wear and tear on this equipment or at least um, how it's functioning in the short term. And another thing to consider in marine environments, especially in Seattle, 
is a special inspection of the equipment to make sure that the sea air isn't isn't corroding anything that shouldn't be breaking down. So here's our maintenance checklist, and, and it's pretty high level at this point, but you'll notice that there's quite a few common components between a heat pump water heating system and a normal gas water heating system that you might be used to. We have pretty typical storage tanks and plumbing components, as well as the mixing valve and the, the circulation system. So you'll see that a lot of these a lot of this might just be kind of a refresher to remind you that maintenance is important in all water heating systems, not just heat pump systems. But at, so at this point, I will I'll take a pause for questions. So input those in the Slido by scanning the QR code here with your camera phone. Or if you can't access that for any reason, you can drop them in the chat as well. And Sean, did we have any? additional questions there uh no additional questions um just to let everyone know i did drop uh, a link for the slido in the chat so if you have trouble putting in the code which it doesn't seem to be working and you don't have a phone to use the qr code you can click on that link from your desktop or laptop and it should take you to the slido poll sorry about that i don't know if you just saw my teams pop up on the screen but i've closed it <clears throat> Great, so we'll hang on for a few, maybe 30 more seconds here, and it's okay to sit in silence sometimes, but uh, I just want to give, make sure I give people a chance to get their questions in uh, without having to type furiously. Yeah, that's a really great question for maintenance for heat pump water heater maintenance. Is it going to be the plumber scope or the factory reps? And I think a lot of that will depend on the equipment and where your equipment is, where it's located. So in Seattle, for instance, we've done a lot of Colmac installations and they have they have third party service contractors that come out for a lot of those buildings and services equipment, while the factory reps um, handle the troubleshooting of this equipment really well. And they're really in tuned to um, what might happen to it to, to make it not act as it should. And so they can answer a lot of really great questions that a typical service contractor might not have. And so with that, we'll go ahead and move forward here. And if you have any additional questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat. I think this may be a good time actually to take a five minute break before we dive into the maintenance of all these all these components. So if you if you think of any questions during the break, go ahead and drop those in the chat and we'll cover those before we go ahead and move on. Um, otherwise, we will meet back here. We can meet back here at 10.50. So go grab a cup of coffee and get ready to learn about some heat pump maintenance.
All right, welcome back. Uh, looks like it is time to dive into maintenance for these heat pumps. Um, Sean, did you see any questions pop up in the chat in the chat by chance while we were gone? Uh, no questions as of now. All right. Great. So talking about the maintenance of heat pump water heaters, this is probably if you're if you're an HVAC technician, you might be really familiar with all of these maintenance points, but this might be the one portion of a plumbing system as a plumber that you might not be familiar with maintaining. So to start to talk about how we might maintain these, it's a good idea to understand the high level of what's happening in these heat pump water heater systems. So despite the second law of thermodynamics telling us uh, vaguely paraphrasing here, that heat can only be transferred from hot to cold. A heat pump water heater is actually pulling heat out of really cold source air, sometimes down to zero degrees, and bringing that up to 140 degree water temperatures. So how do they do this? Well, it's a, it's a really important manipulation of refrigerant pressure that is getting this done. So we have a compressor in this system and it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's pumping that refrigerant up to a high pressure on the right side and it's keeping it in that side of the cycle. And then we have an expansion valve on the other side that's slowly bleeding that pressure or slowly bleeding that refrigerant to the cool side. Sorry, I have a, a sneeze to get out here, one sec. Okay, sorry about that. So we're flowing this refrigerant around the cycle. And so we have a high pressure side here and a low pressure side here. And the reason that's important is because as a refrigerant changes in pressure, it's also gonna change in temperature. You might have noticed this if you are, if you've used spray cans or even dust off to clean off your keyboard or other components, you'll notice when you let that gas out of the can, the can itself becomes really cold. And that's because the pressure inside the can has dropped significantly, which is causing that temperature to drop as well. So the same thing's happening with this heat pump, where as soon as you go from this high pressure system down to the low pressure system through the expansion valve, we're, we're dropping that refrigerant pressure really rapidly, uh, which will drop in temperature. And the opposite happens when we're sending the refrigerant through this compressor from low pressure to high pressure, you raise that pressure. Now you're raising the refrigerant temperature. So even though the refrigerant has about the same energy as it goes through this expansion valve, it's dropping in temperature enough to then be cooler than the air that is being sent over that heat exchanger or the evaporator in this case. So the refrigerant drops in pressure and temperature becomes really cool. Now it's it can soak that heat up from the air, which is now that air that's now warmer than this low pressure refrigerant. So it soaks that energy up and then the compressor pressurizes that refrigerant and brings it up to a really high pressure, which will then drive a really high temperature. So it's soaking up this energy, raising in pressure and temperature, and now it's hot enough to transfer that heat back out and into the domestic hot water. And this is from 140 to 160 degrees in most applications. So that change in pressure has allowed us to pull that heat out of the sometimes sub-zero air and bring that up to a, a concentration that allows us to heat 140 degree water. And it's doing this really efficiently because we're not paying for the energy coming out of this air. We're not uh, lighting a flame and burning fuel or putting electricity through electric resistance to create that heat. We're just harvesting it from the environment. And then the little bit that we pay for is the work that this compressor does 
to raise that pressure in order to effectively transfer that heat into the hot water. So the reason that I am I'm telling you how this system works is because those pressures are really important to consider as part of the inspection of the heat pump water heaters. So I've dropped this into three buckets and the first is inspection of certain components. Um, main, those main components will be the evaporator that uh, you'll want to make sure that there's no corrosion or anything like that on the evaporator, especially in marine environments. And then we will check those refrigerant pressures and make sure those line up with what the what the manufacturer would recommend. So it's good to check those refrigerant pressures up front when the equipment is installed and running properly and make sure those pressures don't vary too much in uh, down the road. But you have to keep in mind though that these pressures will vary with air and water temperature variances. So at that point, it's good to um, check in with your manufacturer's rep. And sometimes there's manufacturer's documents that show where the pressure should be for these different conditions, but likely to um, double check the pressure against what you should expect, you will have to reach out to the rep or the manufacturer to kind of double check those numbers. In the last inspection point, or one of the last major inspection points is gonna be that metering valve that changes the flow through this heat pump water heater. So what's that? what that's doing is in these single pass systems, it slows the flow down through the water flow through the heat pump just enough to allow that water to have enough time to raise all the way up to 140 degrees before it leaves the heat exchanger. So if that valve is inoperable or it, there's there's crud stuck it in it or anything like that, then you your heat pump will have a hard time targeting those temperatures. So it's good to make sure to check that as well as make sure to listen to it, to listen for smoothness. If there's any uh, gravelly sounds or any kind of resistance like that, then it'd be good to check with the manufacturer's tech to um, see if it needs to be replaced or if it could be cleaned internally or something like that. So <clears throat> in addition to inspecting those components, there will also be components to clean. And these are um, the filters and strainers. And I will, I will get into that in a couple slides here, as well as maintaining your heat exchangers and descaling any buildup that you have in there. So I, I mentioned that the a lot of different systems are unique in their maintenance requirements. So it is great to refer to the manufacturer's documentation or talk to the rep when creating a service uh, service agreement for these. <coughs> Excuse me. And so these are the two main things you'll need to actually clean on a heat pump water heater. And that is the air filter that is keeping any debris out of that evaporator coil, as well as the Y strainer that's keeping debris out of the water that flows through your heat pump. And you'll also want to make sure that if, if you're in an area like this where there's a, a lot of leaves falling or debris built up, then you'll want to clear that from the space around your heat pump because even if you clean your filter, as soon as you turn your heat pump on, those leaves can be sucked right back into the filter. So you have a consistently dirty filter there. And then the what happens if your Y strainer is, is not totally clean is it will impede that flow going through the heat pump. So you won't have enough water flowing through the heat pump to effectively get rid of that heat. So you might have, um, looking at the pressure of the system, you might have much higher refrigerant pressures and much hotter temperatures leaving the heat pump than what it was set for. And in terms of flushing and descaling the condenser, so in, in the context of a heat pump water heater, the condenser is the heat exchanger that, that transfers that heat into the domestic hot water. Um, opposing, opposed to a, a chiller, 
where the condenser is that air coil that exhausts the heat out into the atmosphere. <clears throat> so thinking of a condenser, or you can simply just think of it as a heat exchanger, we want to make sure that the walls of that heat exchanger are really clean so then we can effectively transfer that heat into the water. And if it's not clean, you'll see some performance degradation and you will see those higher refrigerant pressures in the heat pump because the refrigerant has to get much hotter to effectively transfer that same heat into the water because your, your heat transfer is much less efficient. So after you've thought about the heat pump and what to maintain there, we can move on to the storage tanks, which are going to be um, the same type of maintenance that you would need to do in a typical gas-fired system. Um, but it's still really important to think about and get a reminder of because there can, because premature failure in these tanks can add to a lot higher cost in the long run, as well as some peripheral damage in the mechanical room from from loose water. So we can drop this this maintenance into three buckets as well, between inspection, cleaning, and replacement. And so what we're going to want to inspect is that pressure relief valve that should be paired with every storage tank and to make sure that it will open properly so you don't have a high pressure situation where your tank actually bursts because that valve's not going to open properly. And we want to make sure that it's not consistently dripping or anything like that because you don't want water damage in your mechanical room. And we're going to want to make sure to clean the tanks on a regular interval to make sure that sediment from the bottom of the tank is flushed out of there, that that sediment can lead to wear as well as provide a provide an environment for unsafe bacteria to grow. So we want to make sure our tanks are nice and clean there. And you'll also want to replace the anode rods regularly because if these anode rods corrode entirely, then they are the last defense for uh, preventing water, preventing corrosion in your tank from the water conditions. So your anode rod is sacrificing itself and it's going to wear down regularly as it's intended to. So you want to replace that before it has done, it has given up all its sacrificial metals to the to the water that's flowing by it <clears throat> so here's a here's a picture of the anode rod when it's new as a nice shiny piece of metal versus when it's when it served its function and sacrificed its sacrificed its metals to the water so then the water doesn't corrode the tank it will just it will just erode this anode rod and you want to make sure that you don't end up like this lovely old couple here with a pond in their basement because if you if you don't do these maintenance to your tank and you let it erode there will be a point where it's going to leak out and you may not even notice and you might get a pond in your basement whether you want one or not and so this applies to this applies to residential systems as well as commercial systems so even if you're not a plumbing installer you can take this advice home and check out replacing this anode rod as well as uh, checking your pressure relief valve. So I want to check in now and see if, and just get feedback on two things that you might have learned so far today. I'll give you a little bit of time here. In the meantime, Sean, did you see any questions coming through the chat? Uh, still no questions. Um, feel free to drop them in if you have any questions whatsoever. Evan is more than happy to answer. Yeah, the more feedback I can get from the people I'm talking to today, the better. So then we can really fine tune the information where we're talking about here. Otherwise, I'll assume there's no questions because I'm just explaining everything so professionally. Uh, 
Uh, oh, yeah, we, oh, mm -hmm. I got we got a comment from Wade saying the uh, just emphasizing the importance of preventive maintenance. That's I guess that's what, yes. what you learned today. Yeah, that is very, very important. Yep, Colmac has factory reps in Seattle. They have Johnson Barrow in Seattle, uh, who has worked with Colmac, or they've sold Colmac's products since they, since Colmac started selling them in the continental United States. Uh, they started out in Hawaii, and now they've have a lot of really successful installations in Seattle. Yep, those are those are two great takeaways is uh, take time to understand the system before starting and do full commissioning at every step. So just make sure you're checking in and communicating properly through each step of the installation. Yeah, and for retrofits, you can save a lot of upfront cost and waste a lot less equipment if you use the existing equipment and add the heat pump water heaters to that. And on the sacrificial anodes, <clears throat> this is a good question. Is there a way to combine this with tank inlets and outlets when there's limited ports? Um, that's that's a good that's a good question that I haven't I've never attempted to answer. And I would think that as long as there's consistent water flowing, you might get away with that. Oftentimes there's dedicated ports specifically for the anode rod, so I don't know if you can use those for anything else anyways. Um, but I would probably talk to the tank manufacturer you're trying to use if you want to locate those outside the tank specifically. Great, so any more questions or comments, definitely just drop them in the chat and we can go ahead and move on here. So we can move on to the the maintenance of the temperature maintenance system, which again has really common components um, from the heat pump water heater that we already talked about to the storage tank or electric resistance water heater in some cases that you might be familiar with. So I wanna check real quick what your understanding is of the temperature maintenance system. We'll be able to review that a little bit later here, but it's good to uh, establish a baseline while we talk about the, the maintenance of some of these components. Great, we have at least one person that's ready to teach it. So I'll have you come up here and talk with me a little bit. We can converse on these and then someone that is at least one person that is still learning and that is that's a great place to be in okay so as a high level review of the temperature maintenance system our goal of this system and the purpose that it serves is to maintain the temperature throughout the entire distribution system, uh, which in this case is the domestic hot water distribution. So to do that, we wanna make sure that this hot water reaches every faucet by continuously circulating this water through all of these different branches. And oftentimes, especially in larger buildings, that will involve these balancing valves at the end of each branch to make sure water is going just quickly enough to make it to the faucet in time before it cools down but not so quickly that we're wasting pump energy or heat so these balancing valves are really important and should be part of your maintenance schedule uh, as you as you go through the system maintenance and it's depending on the valve there will be different um, different considerations for maintenance sometimes they are um they are um, thermostatic so those components need to be cleaned sometimes sometimes they are constant flow so they have different internal components and sometimes they are or a lot of times are this circuit setter type so the 
kind of the inspection portion of this maintenance will be just to make sure that these faucets are still getting hot water in a reasonable amount of time. So if you if you time if you take a stopwatch and figure out how much time it takes water to get to some of these taps, that time shouldn't really change as the system ages, right? Your your water should still circulate at about the same rate to be able to get that hot water to each tap in an efficient manner. So we can drop this in, we can drop the temperature maintenance system maintenance into a few buckets as well between uh, inspection, replacement, and cleaning. And we want to, uh, in terms of inspection, we want to make sure we're checking the water supply temperature at the mixing valve that's going out to the building, as well as the supply temperature at some fixtures to make sure that that's, that's circulating properly. And we'll also check the um, resistant elements in the tank, make sure that it's still heating properly and drawing the right amount of power. And we will check the distribution system points by mainly checking the water temperatures out of the taps. And we'll also um, check the anode rods in that tank, just as we would with the storage tanks. And we're going to clean the mixing valve, which is a really important step that a lot of um, a lot of building owners don't do as they should. So why do we want to maintain these large tanks that are often involved in the temperature maintenance system? Uh, that's because it's going to take a lot less time and money to perform these maintenance procedures on a regular interval, interval than it would to replace the tank before it actually needs to be replaced. Right? Oftentimes these these tanks may go in before the building's even fully built because they can't even fit through a standard door. So you might be tearing the tearing the wall off a mechanical room or disassembling some components from this tank to actually get it out of the room and get a new tank in. So it's really important to do this continuous maintenance on the tanks so we can leave those tanks in as long as possible and minimize those replacement costs over the life of the building. And we want to maintain the temperature, the um, thermostat mixing valve, because we don't want to end up like Homer Simpson here, and and we don't want our residents to either. So we don't want them to be scalded, <clears throat> which is really a really important life safety function for the thermostatic mixing valve, because these water temperatures that are being stored in these systems are getting uh, warmer and warmer as the technology progresses as well as some of the goals for load shift and things like that. So you can see on this graph here that if you are if you get your water temperature up to 150 degrees, which is pretty common storage temperature in CO2 systems, you can have, you can have scalding in two seconds. So especially if we, if we consider Elizabeth James, our senior housing, where the, the seniors are a little less sensitive or they're, their feelings to this water are a little less sensitive and they might be a little slower to react. They might not even notice that they're being scalded by the time they're being scalded. So it's super important to make sure that that, that thermostatic mixing valve is up to par and properly maintained through intervals recommended by that valve manufacturer. And to pair with that maintenance, oftentimes there's going to be a data sheet. And so you can, I would recommend putting it right in the mechanical room, pasted, maybe laminated right next to the mixing valve with a Sharpie tied to it. So then you can see exactly when this valve was maintenance uh, maintained and building management can um, make sure that those intervals are being filled out properly. <clears throat> and the last thing we'll talk about maintaining here is controls. And there's not a whole lot of maintenance to do on these controls, but there is some inspection that you can think about. And so the inspection portion of this is to check the hardware of the controls as well as the software. And the hardware portion is a lot of times the degradation of the hardware in these controls relies or is um, dependent on the conditions that it's being uh, that's 
that it's installed in. So say if you're on a sunny rooftop, maybe the, the plastic casing or the wires leaving these control systems, they might tend to get brittle and crack. So you'll wanna look out for that. And when you're talking about maintaining the software on these controls, that's something I would um, really caution in terms of changing any set points or anything. Make sure that make sure you're not coming up with any alarms or anything like that. But don't actually don't touch the set points unless it is in coordination with the designer and the equipment manufacturer to make sure that it's not um, not negatively affecting that heat pump water heater system. So as a, a high level review of the maintenance points we talked about, we talked about maintaining the heat pumps and uh, through the inspection of some of these components, as well as the, the cleaning of the heat exchangers and the, whoops. Oh, I accidentally exited the presentation. Sorry about that. But we talked about the maintenance of the heat pumps as well as the maintenance of the storage tanks and maybe even served as served a reminder to um, to those of you at home that have your own uh, water heaters in your basement that you might not have touched for the last five years or so. Um, we talked about the maintenance of the temperature maintenance system, which includes the mixing valve and this distribution loop, as well as the temperature maintenance tank, and even sometimes a auxiliary or a dedicated heat pump water heater for that system. And then we talked about the maintenance of controls and some of the hardware, but also the importance of leveraging those controls for for alarming, uh, monitoring alarming as well as uh, overall system function. So I wanna ask what questions remain for you in terms of maintaining these heat pump water heating systems? So that can, that can include a question as well as anything I might have overlooked during throughout these different component descriptions. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna get some great feedback from possibly some installers out there, or even if you, if, if you've just heard of things going on in these systems from either lack of proper maintenance or, or something else. I'll go ahead and move forward. And if you didn't get time to ask any questions in the Slido, go ahead and drop those in the chat. And then um, me and Sean can bring that up and answer any questions you might have. And we have one popped up before I changed here. Uh, what do you feel is the most overlooked maintenance item? I would say <clears throat> the, the most overlooked maintenance item that has had the largest impact in a lot of the systems I've seen is going to be that thermostatic mixing valve. If you don't, if you don't clean those interior components uh, frequently or at a, at a consistent interval, then you're gonna have a lot of water supply issues that lead to cold water calls, which in my experience has oftentimes been blamed on the heat pump because it's the source of this heat, but actually, ends up being just the, the mixing valve can't maintain temperature anymore because it's it has too much buildup in its internal components. Then on a multiple heat pump system, do the controls help stage the heat pumps? Yeah, there's, I talked a bit in the last session about different tiers of controls and it really depends on the system, but sometimes the heat pump itself 
um, controls all the other heat pumps in the systems through internal controls. Other times the uh, external controls will tell the heat pumps exactly when to run and then the heat pumps will follow that blindly. So at our case study today with Elizabeth James, the heat pumps are actually controlling themselves and each heat pump has its own control logic and the temperature maintenance has its own control logic based off the electric resistance heater and the sensor in that tank. But then the Jackson, the site we talked about last week, has a totally external controls platform that looks at all the system temperatures and then tells the heat pumps and the backup heating uh, when to run based off its own internal logic. So now that we've talked about um, we've talked about maintenance and inspection and installation light from this session. Now we can go into a review of all four sessions uh, in the in the next half an hour or so. So this would be a great place to ask any uh, lingering questions that weren't discussed in this entire series. But I will try to I'll try to tackle this as best I can at sort of a high level. Uh, because of course we've spent about seven hours now going into the finer details of these these larger points so there's we talked about four commercial heat pump water heater system components that that need to be here for a for an operational system and the first is the primary heat pump water heater so this is heating cold water up to a high temperature and charging the primary storage tank with that hot water. And then we have the temperature maintenance system that is maintaining the water that circulates through this piping and keeping the water throughout the building warm. So that usually has a dedicated heat pump water heater that can handle these warm return temperatures a lot better. And then the last um, large component of this system is going to be the controls. And in this schematic, you can see that the, the controls are reading the tank temperatures and then telling these heat pumps when to run based off how charged the system is. And a recap of our temperature maintenance systems we've gone over, uh, this, should, this should address the question at the very beginning about um, that talked about different temperature maintenance capabilities and where to where to plumb for those. So we have our first temperature maintenance system we talked about was a dedicated parallel temperature maintenance system. So the the temperature maintenance tank is serving its own function uh, independently of the primary storage and the primary heating system. And the the advantage of that is we have a lot of times we have a heat pump water heater tied to that system that is a dedicated heater that can handle those warm return temperatures. So in systems with really high heat loss, we we can employ this dedicated um, parallel system that can make up that heat loss with a heat pump rather than an electric heater. Then we have the dedicated swing tank or a dedicated series temperature maintenance connection. And the the difference here is the water from the primary storage will now travel through the temperature maintenance tank before it goes out to the building to be used by the occupants. And in doing that, it's warming up the water in that temperature maintenance tank so you don't have to use any auxiliary heating for that temperature maintenance load as long as your building's using water, using hot water. So this system is really well employed in buildings with pretty consistent usage and low temperature maintenance losses because in these types of systems you can have you can exercise that full heating from the primary storage and not require an auxiliary heater for this temperature maintenance heating and the there's also a combined system and that is where the temperature maintenance just flows right back to the primary storage so you have to be really careful with these combined systems in terms of controls and set points and what your heat pump water heater can actually handle 
but as long as you're using the right manufacturer that recommends this combined system, you can still see um, high efficiency in this return to primary configuration. Then the last configuration is uh, no recirculation. So we don't have a continuous loop recirculating through the building, but oftentimes instead we have heat tape on that supply pipe. So the water that's sitting in those pipes doesn't cool down to an unacceptable temperature. So in that case, you don't actually have to have a dedicated temperature maintenance function in your water heating plant because you have that heat tape keeping the water warm. We talked about three different case studies in this series, and the first was HopeWorks Station, which was a, a new construction project that had a goal for zero net energy. So the solar on the roof offset all of the water heating and space heating energy requirements, as well as the plug loads. And to, to accomplish that and leave optimal space on the roof, we have 13 small sand and single pass units lined along the edge of these solar panels. And those are all serving a really short riser that have rooms paired on each level that minimize that supply pipe length. So the trace tape that we put on that supply pipe to keep that water warm doesn't have to use a lot of extra energy. And the total energy usage in this system was 1.2 kilowatt hours per day per person. So it's a lot lower, between two and three times lower than if we used an electric resistance heater. <clears throat> and then the, the next case study we talked about in session three was Jackson Apartments. And this was a new construction site in Seattle. This is a market rate building. And it used two larger Colmax CXA-15s and those were located in the parking garage, which allowed that, that buffer um, as the air passed through the parking garage. And so that air could soak up extra heat from the cement in the parking garage and satisfy those heat pumps, even in really in the coldest design temperatures in Seattle. And this operated on a parallel loop configuration because we're dealing with a really large building with a large loop and Colmac was able to supply a heat pump that can handle those higher entering water temperatures. So we were still able to handle those temperature maintenance losses really efficiently. And we saw a 15% annual energy savings in this building because of the heat pump water heater system. In the last, the last case study we talked about today was Elizabeth James, which was that senior housing a uh, low income retrofit with the four Sandman single pass heat pump water heaters. And these were paired with 320 gallon tanks for that primary heating system. And then they were plumbed in series with a swing tank. And we were able to utilize the, uh, the existing electric boilers and the existing storage tank as that swing tank system. And the, the heat pumps were placed directly outside because those CO2 heat pumps can go in sub-zero temperatures, which leaves a really strong buffer between Seattle's design cold temperature, about 26 degrees, and the minimum temperature those heat pumps can handle. And the total energy that we saw out of that building in the domestic hot water system was about one kilowatt hour per day per person. So still about three times reduction in energy because of this heat pump water heating system. And we also talked about, in session three, we talked about all of the things you'll need to think about as you process this design from the engineer and turn it into an operational system. So we talked about the attributes that the contractor, uh, positive attributes a contractor can convey to properly install this system as well as the details that you need to fill in for your equipment to make sure the, the equipment itself matches the design intent of the system. And we talked about the communication with the manufacturer's rep and the, the last checkpoints that you need to make before you verify and purchase your equipment. 
as well as different things we need to think about during the installation and startup of the equipment. And then finally, we talked about maintenance of all the different components in the water heating system. And we acknowledge that a lot of these components are the same as a gas water heating system that you might be used to. So we talked about what you need to clean in each component, as well as the consistent maintenance intervals of these systems and the inspection of certain components, as well as the replacement of things like the anode rods in the in the water heater tanks. And with that, I want to check and see if there's any final questions and any takeaways that have that you've gotten from this presentation. So I will let's see, I will I'll leave this exit survey up so then you have plenty of time to fill that out as we as we talk about some upcoming sessions that will be offered from DNR. Potentially. Yeah, so so we do have some upcoming trainings here. Uh, the, the main one that is coming up next is going to be the why and how of commercial heat pump water heaters. And that is given on March 1st through the Lighting Design Lab. And that's gonna be given by Colin Grist from Ecotope. He's an amazing engineer that has been working on these heat pump systems for a long time. So there's a lot of really great information there. And Sean, with that, do you have any DNR happenings that you might want to uh, speak up to coming up? Um, let me take a look at our schedule. Um, hmm. Not really. I'm trying to take take a look yeah sorry i kind of put you on the spot there but um <laughs> one other thing that i'll say about dnr is they they've worked really closely with ecotope and a lot of manufacturers to uh, provide a lot of really great content starting with these presentations that the um that a lot of ecotopers have been able to share information with the world through as well as these really cool modules to um, spread information about heat pump water heaters in a really organized fashion. So designers and installers that are really unfamiliar with these products can reference these modules and, and get the information they need. So I'm not, I'm not totally aware of the channels they're, they're sending those modules through to be open to the public, but I'm sure you can email uh, some DNR folks and get more information on that. Um, do you know, Sean, if another question puts you on the spot here, uh, do you know if there's information on your website about yeah, so, these? Oh yeah, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, if you go to D, uh, if you go to DNR's website, you can get to DNR Learn, and that will show our course list. Um, looking at our list, we have um, a couple courses on commercial refrigeration on the 22nd and the 24th. And then um, we have some courses on energy management systems and HVAC control controls on the 8th and 10th. OK, great. And I just dropped our link into the chat, too. So feel free to poke around there. We have quite a few things um, coming up in the coming months. So feel free to take a look. Perfect. Great. And did we have any? Any final questions in the chat we might want to talk about? Uh, nothing in the questions box. OK. Great. Well, you guys might get a little bit of time back. I see uh, Sean jumped back online. So uh, is there anything you'd like to share from the Lighting Design Lab, Sean? 
So I would like to say uh, thank you very much to uh, Evan, Sean, Sarah, uh, all of our uh, uh, DNR and Ecotope friends. Um, as Evan has mentioned, uh, March 1st will be the first session of the why and how of uh, commercial heat pump water heaters. There will also be a part two on uh, Wednesday, March 9th, uh, again, from uh, 10 to 11. So both of those are available. Check them out at lightingdesignlab.com slash education. Um, we will also be adding additional content with respect to uh, further upcoming classes shortly, uh, including likely uh, the Network Lighting Controls uh, Fundamentals uh, two-day class, uh, back to uh, audits and retrofit techniques for, for lighting. And we're also likely to reprise coming up at, at some point soon our series on uh, the changes to the Seattle Energy Code. So uh, look for those. Uh, and doubtless we will be uh, collaborating more with our friends from uh, Ecotope and DNR uh, on this platform for uh, additional education, particularly with respect to uh, topics surrounding building electrification and uh, uh, some of the opportunities there. So uh, did you have anything else, Evan, Sarah, or Sean? I just want to say thank you, Sean, from Lighting Design Lab for hosting us for this and being able to get this information out there. That's super crucial. And thanks to Sean from DNR for uh, helping orchestrate this and handling all the questions that came in. And of course, thank you to you all for hanging on with us, for some of you for this full eight hours of information and others for this session today. I appreciate you listening. Okay, last reminder, if you need uh, for any point to review any of the material, you'll find that the recordings for all of these classes are up hosted on the lightingdesignlab.com. Go to our education tab and you can go to prior classes. And that's true of basically everything that we've done from a webinar standpoint since the uh, um, some odd spiky virus made things a little complicated for in-person learning. So uh, feel free to go and check all of that stuff out. And with that, um, unless there's something else for you guys, shall we give everyone back a little part of their day? Nothing Should for me. All right, well then once again, on behalf of Seattle City Light and the Lighting Design Lab, thank you for participating, thank you for joining, and you all have yourselves a fantastic day. Thanks everyone. Oh, please, don't forget to uh, fill out the exit uh, questionnaire. It's very, very, very helpful for us to uh, know what's working well, what could be better, and uh, what your thoughts are with respect to additional topics. So with that, once again, have yourselves a great day.